everybody. Welcome back to another I Care for Your Brain with board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Karen Sullivan. That is me. Tonight I am back with another full length lecture. Sometimes I like to do the bite sizes, but other times certain topics just require a more in depth exploration. So tonight we're going to be talking about my concerns as a brain health specialist about the medication Ambien. And I'm going to give you my top five reasons that I get worried about it in my patients. So first, let's do a little bit of background. Ambien is used to treat insomnia. Now, insomnia is not as straightforward as it sounds. Yes, it generally means an interference of the uninterrupted five to nine hours of sleep we are all supposed to get, but we actually have multiple types of insomnia and they can also be classified by duration. So we have a wide range of sleep requirements as human beings that most likely go back to genetic reasons. And it all comes down to our ability to clear a compound called adenosine. And this is a byproduct of cell production, cell energy. Kind of think of it like the smoke coming off of a fire. For some of us, it takes extra long to break it down and clear it away, and other people are super efficient, clearer outers. So some of those folks need more like the five hours, and the rest of us need more of the eight to nine hours. So within the different types of insomnia, the three types, there are two types that are appropriate for short-term use of Ambien. So we have initial insomnia and we have middle insomnia. And this is where the immediate and the extended release versions come in of Ambien. So initial insomnia is when you just cannot fall asleep on the front end, but once you do, you're actually okay. Middle insomnia is where your sleep is broken up all throughout the night. You just feel like you're constantly staying in shallow sleep. You're never really making the transition into all the different sleep cycles. This is what we think about when we are considering the extended use. So basically it's got two layers. You get the initial impact early on, but overnight the way the medication breaks down is you actually continue to get more and more of the release so it keeps you asleep. The Extended release can also be good for people who have late onset insomnia. So this usually happens more as we get older. You're able to fall asleep, but then you wake up much too early and you're not able to fall asleep again. Insomnia is classified by duration as well. So transient insomnia is less than one month. Short term is between one and six months. And chronic is that special type of hell when you have not been able to get a good night's sleep for at least six months months. Ambien, according to the FDA, is appropriate for only transient and short term, but many people are using it for chronic and sneak peek. That's actually one of my concerns. So Ambien has a rather rapid onset of action within 30 minutes. It is usually given in a pill, but we also see that it is available in a spray or a sublingual tablet. Usually comes in five to 10 milligrams. One of the questions I had when I first started learning about Ambien is what is the mechanism of action? How does it actually work? Well, it slows down activity in the brain. And how it does that is it increases the availability of a neurotransmitter called GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, very long word. This is the primary inhibitory chemical in the brain. So whenever we need the breaks applied in the brain, we have an increase in GABA. Ambien also acts as a minor muscle relaxant. Most people don't know that, but that is kind of the way it allows us to accept sleep. Sleep is very interesting because you can't force it, right? You can't make yourself sleep. You actually have to relax enough to let it overtake you. And that is a huge challenge for anyone with symptoms of hypervigilance or a history of trauma uh, in all forms, medical trauma, interpersonal trauma, natural disaster trauma. It is very hard to just kind of trust the process and lean in to going unconscious. That is very triggering for a lot of people. It is mostly metabolized in the liver liver and then the metabolites are let go of in the urine. Ambien is the only drug in the United States with what we call sex-based 
dosing. And this is really, really interesting. So this goes back to 2013 when the FDA recommended that the dose of Ambien for women should be half of what it is for men. And this was based on some studies that showed that women and men metabolized Ambien differently, mostly because of the presence of testosterone. A later review disputed this a little bit and said probably what the researchers were picking up on was actually more of an age effect and less of a gender effect and that reducing it by 50% may actually be too large and that we need to focus on older adults more than the age of 65. Ambien was first approved in the U.S. in 1992 and became a generic in 2007. It is a Schedule IV class controlled substance, and in 2020, 14 million prescriptions of Ambien were filled in the United States. The label, the indication through the FDA, is that it is appropriate for two to six weeks of usage in the treatment of insomnia at the lowest possible dose. You will get to sleep about eight to 20 minutes faster with the immediate release, as opposed to if you took a sugar pill, 15 minutes is about average. I think most people actually overestimate the power of most sleeping medications. And when you actually look at the research, 15, 20 minutes, is that really that significant? It is only recommended as what we call a second line intervention after people have done two things before this. So the first one is sleep hygiene, and the second one is cognitive behavioral treatment for insomnia. So this was the recommendation following a 2012 study that found that the drugs tended to have much more psychological effects than they actually did physiological. So it kind of gets back to this idea of a placebo effect and how much of it is the story that we tell ourselves. So I just said sleep hygiene a minute ago, wanted to just tell you because that's the very first thing you should be doing when you are having a problem with sleeping. So these are really the habits that you can do that either support or negate high quality sleep. So think of it as really implementing common sense. A lot of it is what we all know we should do, but just through our lifestyle, it's just not easy. But you basically want to think about your habits in your bedroom environment, your internal environment, and your daily routine. So keep keeping a generally regular sleep schedule, creating a sanctuary type environment in the bedroom, giving yourself the message that it is time to reduce stimulation through a relaxing bedtime routine, making sure you are reducing light exposure. You really need to communicate explicitly to your brain that it is time to stop doing, it is time to stop engaging, and it is the time where we are gonna to start to become more receptive and allow ourselves to be more in touch with our natural rhythm. If it is dark enough, if we are relaxed enough internally, if we are, have low stimulation in our environment, we should really be able to allow sleep to come. After you try that for a good few weeks, if it doesn't work, now you're ready for CBTI. This is cognitive behavioral for insomnia. This is what you should try before you reach for any sleep medication, over the counter or prescription. And it really focuses on the way we think and the way we feel about sleep and what do our thinking, our behaviors and our feelings around sleep contribute to the experience of insomnia. So we all know one thing that happens when we can't sleep is we get very anxious about not sleeping, right? So nothing will keep you awake more than the fear of what staying awake is going to do to your quality of life the next day. I'm not gonna be able to think, I'm not gonna be able to function, I'm gonna be exhausted, this is bad for my health. All of these things, if you are wired a certain way to perseverate, to just be anxious at your baseline, these things actually become the very barrier towards getting a good night's sleep. So treatment with CBTI is six to eight sessions. It's a multi-component treatment because it has cognitive, behavioral, and education intervention. So let me just give you a sample of what one of the cognitive pieces look like, and then we're gonna get back to Ambien. So one thing is called cognitive restructuring. And what is interesting about this is it helps you to identify inaccurate, unhelpful or distorted 
thoughts and beliefs you have about sleep. Again, so your feeling about the impact of not sleeping actually then winds up becoming the very reason you can't sleep. It's very meta, actually. Once you are then stressed out about not sleeping, now you've got a secondary issue, which is the dumping of stress hormones into your bloodstream, the cortisol, the adrenaline, which now create another barrier towards getting a good night's sleep. So this is a problem that they target in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So they help you identify what are some of those thoughts. A lot of them are kind of pre-conscious. You might not even be realizing you're having them and they're just not helpful. So in the comments, for this lecture, I'm going to give you a great resource I found online from the University of Massachusetts Medical School that challenges these thoughts and beliefs. So we identify them and then we challenge them. So one of the beliefs is I must get eight hours of sleep. Another one is I will not be able to function tomorrow. My insomnia is going to cause health problems. I cannot fall asleep without a sleeping pill or I didn't sleep at all last night. So they actually go through in this cognitive restructuring intervention and actually teach you a more adaptive, healthy way to process all of those thoughts when they do come up. So the idea there, it's actually quite effective is if you change the way you think about sleeping and the consequences of an occasional poor night's sleep, that you may actually be able to reverse the problem of insomnia and sleep better. Okay, so now we're gonna get into back to ambient. So I always like to tell you what I think is the positive alternative, not just point out problems. So what are my five concerns as a neuropsychologist? Well, the first one is that ambient may impair your cognition more than you realize. So in the morning after you've taken an ambient, especially if you've taken the extended release, you really shouldn't do anything for at least four hours that requires you to be alert, to make quick decisions, uh, process complex information, to be safe. And that's a big ask. The first four hours are potentially when you're getting up to do work. You know, prepare your family for a day out in the world. Ambient impacts what we call episodic memory. This is a type of short-term memory. And I have heard to, this is probably my number one reason for being concerned. I've heard so many stories as a neuropsychologist about people who have engaged in very complex behaviors, sleeping, uh, pardon me, dry, <laughs> driving, uh, having arguments, having sex, uh, and having no memory of it whatsoever. That is not okay. These people are essentially sleepwalking. They are sleep driving. They are sleep eating. They appear to be fully awake, but they are not. The manufacturers of this medicine say, if you don't have a full seven to eight hours of sleep before you are active again, then this medicine might not be for you and you may be engaging in what they call complex sleep behaviors. The NIH website says that alcohol uh, before taking an Ambien may also increase the likelihood of having a complex sleep behavior, which is you do something and you're sleeping and you don't realize. Ambien is labeled as a no-go pill by the United States Air Force with a six hour restriction on any flight operation or special duty personnel activities due to concerns about what other groups have called an Ambien hangover. The FDA has had three warnings on Ambien and other prescription sleep medication. So in 2019, uh, the FDA put a box warning on it, which is their most prominent warning offered by the FDA on not just Ambien, but also Lunesta and Sonata. And they reported 66 cases of complex sleep behaviors occurring with these medicines in the last 26 years that have resulted in serious injury or death. So remember, 66 is only the ones that have actually been reported where people have known to report it or they've had an autopsy. Um, but so the number is probably much higher. These have included accidental overdoses, almost always by combining Ambien or one of these sleep medications with another CNS depressant like alcohol or opioids or benzos, falls, drowning, hypothermia that has caused a loss of a limb, carbon monoxide poisoning, car accidents, self-injury, including gunshot wounds or suicide attempts. So what that would mean is someone trying to kill themselves who actually didn't really want to kill themselves or didn't realize they were doing something so risky to kill themselves. 
About 3% of people who take Ambien are going to break a bone because of falling due to impaired coordination. And remember, all this is happening without any memory of it, no episodic memory, no details in your mind about why it happened. You just eventually wake up and all of a sudden you are injured, you are somewhere else, you are laying next to someone else and you have no memory. Uh, the uh, Australia National Prescribing Service wrote that these events most commonly happen after the very first dose or within a few days of starting to take. So if you've been on it for a while and it's not happened, hopefully it won't happen to you, but I do think it's worthy of talking about. My number two concern is that Ambien is intended for short-term use only, much shorter than you might think, but very few people actually use it this way. So short-term use means no more than five weeks. So 10 to 35 nights is what is recommended. The research suggests that after just a few weeks of taking Ambien, people can develop a mild behavioral dependency on it. So what I mean by that is starting to develop the belief that I can't sleep unless I have my Ambien. 41% of people who use over-the-counter sleep medications report taking them for a year or longer. And this is probably the same thing with prescription medicines. One study in 2019 found that 20% of people continue to use Ambien long-term. Uh, this, this study, when they broke it down by gender, was really, really shocking to me. So of these people who use it, uh, at higher doses for more than 180 days, less than 1% of them are men and 41% of them are women. That is so mind boggling. I actually went back and double checked another source to make sure that that research report wasn't an error. And that is the case. So the mind boggles on, on why that is. Suddenly stopping Ambien can cause withdrawals. Like so many other drugs, the longer you've been taking it or the higher dose you've been taking it, the harder it is to get off of it. People are most likely to have headaches, irritability, kind of rebound insomnia where it gets much worse, anxiety, but all the way up to acute confusion and seizures have also been reported. So it's recommended that we treat it just like trying to get off of gabapentin, trying to get off of Xanax, a benzodiazepine. You want to do it slowly over time and really with the help of a trusted medical provider. Number three is that we have some pretty strong research to suggest that the use of Ambien and other sedative hypnotic sleep medications may worsen depression and increase suicidal thoughts, <coughs> excuse me, in people with depression. Here's the thing, it's a chicken or an egg phenomenon, right? Because insomnia we know aggravates depression, depression causes insomnia. It's very criticized, um, but in a national survey conducted in the United States, Ambien was significantly associated with suicidal thoughts, plans, and attempts. So Ambien has the highest rate of increase amongst drugs used in the year just prior to a completed suicide. But we kind of have that chicken or the egg thing going on here. Which one came first? We don't have any indication that Ambien causes suicidal thoughts in people that are depressed. But I think there's enough research to suggest that it should be on our radar screen if someone does have experiences with depression, we wanna be extra cautious about it. So the FDA label actually cautions people with depression that they should only be prescribed the fewest number of pills that they need in order to avoid overtaking it. A newer, more better designed study recently published in the Journey of Journal of Sleep reported that the risk of suicide peaked immediately before Ambien was prescribed and actually decreased after. So that would kind of suggest that they are parallel processes and the Ambien is just in the mix because the person is so depressed that their sleep is so disrupted. So a little bit of a red herring, but I know that if one of my patients has depression, it's something that I look at a little bit more. Okay, number four is that it can cause overdose, misuse, and dependence. So if you watch my gabapentin video, this is our big viral over a million view video, you know that certain medications have become quite popular in prescribing 
not so much for what they do, but for what they're not, right? So gabapentin has gained a lot of popularity because it wasn't an opioid, it wasn't a benzo. And I think a very similar thing happened with Ambien. When you read about it, a lot of the literature comes out of the gate saying, well, hey, it's not a benzo, so we think it's probably better because benzodiazepines like clonopin, Xanax, we know that they have a very specific negative side effect profile. And so whatever we have that's not that seems to shine. But the truth is, it often leads to us downplaying how powerful and potent these medications are. So the real issue with Ambien is when you combine it with another CNS depressant. So it's a no-go with any type of alcohol opioids, benzos, when you mix them together, this is where you get the accidental overdoses. So the most common combination I've heard hands down is when people take their Ambien while on vacation or traveling and combine it with just one or two drinks, they're really putting themselves at risk for accidental overdose. The risk of dependency with these so-called Z drugs like Ambien increases the longer you use it, and that's just considered 10 nights. And I think that's pretty surprising to many of you out there. It can produce feelings of relaxation and euphoria. And when some people who have a predilection towards addiction have that experience, they want more, 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 more. And this is when we see abuse. So it is not recommended as the first line. Remember, you should try sleep hygiene, cognitive behavioral therapy, because people do misuse it. They snort it, they inject it. There are detox and treatment programs that are very specific just for Ambien. It is just as real as any other addiction, uh, potentially as life-changing and derailing as any other street drug. Wanting to stop, wanting to not use Ambien, but being unable should be a big warning sign to you. Over time, the addiction signs of Ambien are increasingly severe. It winds up taking up more and more of your thought process. You feel like you need more than your original prescription. You're having trouble fulfilling your roles in life as a worker, a student, a parent, a friend. You are denying to people that you're using it or how much you're using. You're denying to yourself how much you're using. You're unable to sleep without it. You're unable to relax. And maybe you've even tried multiple times to get off it and you just can't. Those would all be really big warning signs you should talk to your doctor about. And my fifth concern are age-related concerns that just aren't commonly discussed or known by primary care doctors who don't have expertise in geriatric medicine. So geriatric medicine really tells us that we need to be making different decisions in the care of our patients that are over the age of 65, specifically when it comes to medication. So this is just due to changes in age-related changes in metabolism that are related to kidney and liver function. So in 2015, the American Geriatric Society came out and that said Ambien, along with other sleep medications, should be avoided in people age 65 and older because of their association with harm and the minimal efficacy. But one in five users of Ambien in America is between 65 and 85. And these folks are the most sensitive to having confusion, dizziness falls with Ambien much more likely than younger people. So common side effects to know if you take Ambien and you're in that age group, if you are having dry mouth, next day drowsiness, any impaired balance or coordination, I think this would be a sign that you should talk to your doctor about getting off it. We have nearly twice the risk of hip fracture with Ambien in people over the age of 65. And the authors of the study that focus on age concluded by saying rather than being considered a safer alternative for sleep, Ambien may be associated with risks that are as great as those seen with conventional benzodiazepines in older adults. So I would say there's four warnings that would suggest you really, really should not be taking Ambien. The first one is if you've ever been told you have one of those complex sleep behaviors that you don't remember, even one. Uh, first one might not have been as risky, but the second one, you might actually wind up doing something that could literally end your life. 
Number two is if you are severely depressed, moderately depressed even, if you are struggling with suicidal thoughts, I just don't think it's worth it to risk it. And number three is if you have any cognitive impairment the next day where you really wonder, am I safe to drive? Am I safe to go to work? Especially if your job has anything to do with public safety. And the fourth one is if you're over 65, I really don't think it's worth the potential risk of falling or cognitive impairment. You really should wait four to eight hours before engaging in complex activities after you take it. Um, all concerns should of course be reported to your doctor. Start with sleep hygiene, talk to your doctor about insomnia, medical issues, including medication side effects can all cause sleep disruption. I would then consider CBT insomnia on your own. And if that doesn't work, move on to trying to find a provider and complete the typical standardized six to eight sessions in real life. And if that doesn't work, then I would consider low dose melatonin. There is a specific brand and dosage that I recommend that will also be linked in the comments. If you buy it through Amazon, you're able to support our mission of providing free evidence-based brain health medication to the public. We get a little teeny tiny bit of a uh, um, bonus there for you buying it. And then and only then would I say talk to your physician, your advanced practice provider around a medication like Ambien. I really think you should use it as an absolute last resort. So please let me and other viewers know about your experiences with Ambien in the comments. So much of this vision for being here is about providing high quality information and support. And I think that's on all of us, what you all write in the comments oftentimes is read by other people and then they don't have to reinvent the wheel. They can benefit from your experience, positive or negative. So tell me how you've figured out a relationship with Ambien that feels good to you. Please share this video widely on social media. We want as many people to understand the complexities of this medication as possible. And please give us a subscribe on YouTube. We are here to serve. Please let us know how we can do that better. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye.